Hi crew, welcome to today's episode. Today's guest is a gentleman by the name of John Hearn. Uh, so John is an economics professor um, at a prestigious uh, UK university. Uh, we discuss obviously the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically uh, in relation to um, how it's affected the UK, UK economy. Uh, we also obviously chat about Bitcoin. I get John's um, perspective on Bitcoin as well. Um, before we start the episode, if you can do me a massive favor uh, and please like and subscribe um, to the channel. Uh, and then also, if you wouldn't mind trying to share um, the clip as well uh, on Facebook, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Enjoy. All right, John, welcome. Thank you for uh, jumping on. Um, if you can just maybe give our viewers at home just a bit of an introduction um, as to obviously who you are and what you do. Uh, my name's John Hearn, Professor of uh, Economics, a uh, little bit of banking and finance as well, London Institute of, uh, of Banking and Finance. Uh, I'm uh, basically an economist, been teaching for many years. Uh, I come with a public health warning because my economic doesn't always coincide with what other economists say, uh, and indeed, uh, certainly not what politicians say, because, you know, fairly simple, uh, lots of economists want to be employed, and uh, the government are great employers of uh, economists. And, and for those of you who know supply and demand, uh, you'll know that uh, Governments really demand bad economic advice, and there are plenty of uh, economists out there to supply that bad economic advice. So I'm very much against the sort of Keynesian side of economics, the modern monetary theorists, and I stick a long way out with the Austrian school of thought and the, the monetarist school of thought. So when you listen to me, make sure you listen to somebody else who says something that's totally opposite from what I say and then sit and think, uh, I wonder who's right in this situation. So don't accept that I'm right. I mean, I am, so my conscience is clear, but uh, I, I wouldn't want you to accept that without uh, thinking about what other people are saying as well. Perfect. So you have, um, I guess, a, a controversial uh, uh, side of economics, I guess, compared to most. Is that sort of correct? It's correct, and that's why teaching lecturing seminars have always been great fun because I can stir most people up uh, into thinking because they go no that can't be right can it that can't be right uh, and that you know that's the good thing so you know the people that I teach I don't tell them that uh, um, to believe what I say I tell them to think about what I say and when I throw these things at them they like it and I like it. things are always changing and because I have a little bit of the uh, the off center um approach to things it's fun for me fun for them kept me going for many years perfect and so you've been teaching for quite a while at the tertiary level um, i've i've taught all the way through so i taught it when i first left university i taught in an english public school i thought i'd try out uh, public school life and see what uh, that sort of teaching was like coming from a grammar school myself i'd never seen the that side of things so i taught people like simon cowell the uh, um the man who appears on television rather a lot uh with his uh, whatever his programs are him and his brother nick i talk uh plus uh, quite a few other people then i went to a sixth form college which was absolutely great that uh, uh sixth form colleges are certainly the way to to develop education absolutely certain and then started writing books and then went back to university teaching and i've been doing that for i don't know 20 years or so now so it's uh, it's gone on for uh, a long time and I still enjoy every minute of it. So, so. Yeah, perfect. It's a long career in teaching. Um, I take my hat off to you. I don't know if I could uh, go back to school at least in um, any capacity, really, to be honest with you. I think, yeah, I take my hat off to people that teach for a living. I'd find it quite a difficult job. So I think it's got harder and harder. That's right. I mean, it, it was much easier when I started. Uh, you know, I would do sort of 15 hours a week uh, and uh, and that was uh, my limit then I could play cricket and uh, enjoy the rest of uh, uh, the holiday and, and the summer so it was much easier it's much harder now much more and I wouldn't go into teaching now unfortunately it doesn't produce a career that uh, anyone could want uh, but for me it was ideal at the time and I've just been able to well, I've always worked on the rule of never working more than 15 hours a week anyhow, so I've just, just about managed that. 
<laughs> Sounds like a great rule. I wouldn't mind adopting that myself. Um, uh, that's, sorry. Sorry, you mentioned, um, so you're more so part of the Austrian economic sort of school of thought. Yeah. What's the main difference, um, I guess, between um, like the Austrian economics school versus, I guess, other schools of economics? It, it, there's a fairly sort of simple division between uh, what you would call less interventionist economists and more interventionist economists. So if you are at the side of um, Minsky, Keynes, uh, the, the latest lot modern monetary theorists, then what you're suggesting is something that involves lots of intervention by government, you know, fiscal stimuluses, fiscal packages, we manage things uh, and everything will be wonderful. Uh, the less interventionist economists are the economists who believe that markets work best, that uh, we want less government intervention, we want to leave things to people's own enterprise, uh, look for the entrepreneurial people who are the people who make us all better off uh, and uh, let markets work. And you create, if you like, with government, a, a playing field for, for markets, which is level regulated, like being a referee in, uh, in a football game. Uh, you're not part of the team. You don't play in either side. You haven't got any relations in either. So you've got no skin in the game, but you're there as a rule maker and making sure that everything so that, that's the difference, if you like. The, uh, um, it's the non-intervention, sorry, not non less inter there, are re there are good things government must do, which is rules and regulations, uh, what economists call providing the public good, which is this thing we all want that we're not prepared to pay for, like law and order, uh, internal defense, external defense. Street lighting is always the example used in textbooks. Um, we need someone to provide those things for us. We want them, but we're not prepared to pay them for them because we can't exclude other people from using them. Um, so that is the difference. It is, let's have markets, uh, let's have minimal government, uh, let's leave it to uh, the country, its entrepreneurs uh, and, and people to take risks, make profits if they're successful, make losses and uh, if they make losses that's an indication we better get out of that and you better move somewhere else. Problem is when governments do things and they get it wrong they go oh we need to do more of that uh, and so they pump a little bit more money and they get it wrong again and they go well what yeah we better do more of that so you never have a, a sort of a check or balance with, with government they just do things uh, and if they go wrong they go well we should have done more of it uh, and that's the wrong thing that you want because you want people when they get things wrong to stop doing that and go and do something that's right if that makes sense yeah most definitely that's a very um good explanation I, I did actually read um uh the first part of your um book that you sent me I think it's about a 200 page book um so I read about the first 50 pages um yeah so I kind of had a bit of an idea of what you're about to say then which is good um but it kind of was yeah good to just kind of learn um in the language you've just obviously uh, articulated it in. Um, so look, I wanted to discuss a couple of things with you, John. Um, the first one mostly being the uh, economic impact of um, the COVID, obviously 19 pandemic. Um, are you able to kind of just start off on a couple of sort of key areas that you think um, are worth addressing and then we can just sort of converse um, as we go um, and addressing each of those points if I think they're um, interesting to elaborate on? Yes, certainly. Um, unfortunately, we've dealt with it in a certain way. And uh, there's, as far as I'm concerned, a big argument that we shouldn't have dealt with it uh, in that way. I did see fairly early on that this was something that was really only um, damaging to people with underlying conditions uh, and people who are old. Um, and those are the people we needed to protect. And we didn't do a very good job of protecting them first time round. And I would have let things more or less like the Swedish model. I think Sweden got it right uh, and we got it wrong. But let, let's go past that because it's happened. Now, what we've done in response to that pandemic is damaged a large chunk of the economy, particularly hospitality, travel. And this is not only national, it's a worldwide problem. And we said, no, there's no problem where we can throw money at it. And this, again, is where the economists come in because there are those economists who say, no, it doesn't matter, government can create as much money as it likes, it can uh, spread that money out and it can compensate for everything. Modern monetary theory has a lot to answer for here. Um, 
so what we have done is we've got a budget deficit uh, which will be announced today by the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK, which will probably be a deficit of sort of 300 uh, um, billion pounds for the year biggest deficit ever. That's got to be financed. And you can finance it by um, taxes, which we can't because taxes have been falling because of the lockdown. Uh, you can finance it by borrowing from real people. That's difficult with a large sum like that. So we're financing a large chunk of it by printing. Now, printing is good today and tomorrow and the next day and the next few days because people just see money coming into their pockets and go, yeah, that's fine, problem solved. Uh, but what it does do, if you're not producing anything at the time that you're printing this demand, creating this demand in the economy, then you're building up a problem, which is inflation. Uh, and inflation distorts markets, damages markets, and what you will end up with very soon uh, around the world, unfortunately, is a sort of, sort of system of stagflation, where unemployment is high and where inflation is increasing past all the targets that central banks have set. Uh, and that's when you really will realise uh, the full impact of what we've done. So it's, it's a couple of difficult years ahead. So you think the, the fallout will obviously be seen for at least, say, two years into the future? Yeah, <laughs> possibly even longer than that. It depends how we react. You know, everyone is talking about there'll be a great bounce back now. Um, well, if you drop 10% and you suddenly recover 5%, that's a partial recovery. It's not a great bounce back. It's just a partial recovery. And there will be a partial recovery very quickly. But then it'll be much slower to pick up from there. And um, I do think because we've dealt with the pandemic in this way, it's going to carry on and on. We're still going to have cases. Uh, and if you're going to lock down economies because you've got one case um, that, that appears, then uh, you know, I think you've, uh, you're going to have a, an ongoing, continuing problem, which will just lower living standards and uh, probably won't protect the people who need most protection, uh, which are those people losing their jobs, the unemployed, and um, generally the poorer people in society you know those people in pharmaceutical industries those people in politics those experts making all these decisions they have nice gold-plated salaries uh, so they're not concerned but there's a real knock-on effect for other you know, real people yeah absolutely interesting you um said you know economy shutting down just from for a single case um uh, obviously we were discussing this a little bit before we started recording but um perth had had literally that that exact scenario where we had one um, hotel security guard um, who tested positive for covid who'd been out and about in the community um and our premier mark mcgowan decided to shut down um the whole of western australia for um i believe it was it was about seven days so um, yeah, all gyms shut. Um, only essential yeah. workers were able to, to go into the office. Um, most people had to work from home if they could in that capacity. Um, so yeah, obviously that disrupts uh, society itself quite majorly. Um, outside of uh, crypto in this podcast, I, um, I run a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy. So we're in, I guess, the fitness industry, health and fitness industry. Um, and I think that was probably one of the major um, industries impacted by COVID, at least um, here in Perth um, last year when we had to shut down for that six to eight week period. Um, and then obviously recently with the one week period we had off. What other industries do you think are going to be affected by this um, long term? Uh, well, it's going to be all industries uh, because uh, if you start reducing people's real incomes, they've got less money to spend in the real terms. You give them more money normally, but inflation will absorb that then there's a knock-on effect the immediate effect as we see it is in travel hospitality um, that sort of area uh, but um, quite a lot of people look to Australia look to New Zealand as they got it right and we got it wrong but I think you've still got a, a sort of a lag of effects I know in New Zealand they've closed Auckland down now for seven days because of uh, a couple of cases Melbourne was closed down over the tennis for and I think that's going to just keep, I mean, I should have been in New Zealand uh, last year. Uh, it then went round to, uh, I think I should be in New Zealand now. 
uh, and that was cancelled. And then I should be in New Zealand in November, and that's already been cancelled. And then I'm in New Zealand now, March 2022. Think what effect that has on airlines, travel, the money coming into the country that's spent in the local bars that people are, you know, running from North Ireland to South Ireland or uh, popping out to Ayers Rock and spending loads of money. You, you take all of that out of the system and the impact on the, the world economy is great. There is a sort of uh, something, I think it was 1968, wasn't it, in the UK, there was a Hong Kong virus. I think that, that they all had different names. Very similar, did very similar things. And we know what, I was at university at the time and never even knew it had happened. Uh, it went through the system and out of the system within a year and it was all forgotten. Absolutely nothing was done about it. Um, there were no masks. Uh, I think you know, Pat Harold Wilson on the back at the time for doing absolutely nothing about it. Because I think as we mentioned earlier, if politicians do absolutely nothing, then they are really vulnerable uh, to, you got it all wrong, didn't you? Whereas if they do something, you look at a politician and go, you never got that right, did you? But at least you tried, you know, you're, you're a good person. You, you tried to do something about it. Whereas that person over there said, do nothing, uh, you know, dismiss them. So that for a politician, I've got to do something. Uh, and my legacy is I did things. Uh, and you count up the, the 90 things you did and three of them were right. And you remember those for the rest of your life. I got those right, didn't I? <laughs> Yeah, very um, accurate description of a politician. I had a discussion with a friend of mine earlier this morning um, about something very similar where we were just discussing. So Mark McGowan over here, he's a, he's a pretty polarizing figure. Um, a lot of people have you know, said that he's done quite a good job. Yeah. And he has, he's obviously kept cases quite low. Um, and you know, for the majority of time, the WA government, uh, sorry, the WA economy has done quite well. Obviously we've been able to keep most industries open, you know, money flowing through, all those sorts of things. Um, but our politicians seem to openly, uh, what's the word, bicker, I guess, with each other. So he bickers with, you know, politicians from other states quite openly on Facebook and other sort of social media platforms. And we were just sort of having a conversation about how funny we think that is like the state of politics at the moment, you know, it's quite laughable. I couldn't imagine that happening, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, where people were, you know, obviously openly criticizing each other to that extent. Um, obviously social media and that sort of thing has played a big part in being able to facilitate that. Um, well, yeah. arguably, yeah, arguably social media caused this problem because uh, the, the year of 1968 that I was referring to, no social media, no one was talking about it, no one knew about it and we moved on whereas social media now highlights this sort of every day, news items every day, telling you how bad things are, how terrible things are. And it, it sort of reinforces almost a climate of fear about this. I don't go out because uh, you know, there's always a new theory every day that uh, it's being passed on by the chocolate we eat, or it's being passed on by the services we touch, or it's coming through the windows in the air. And if you, you sort of listen to all these descriptions of things, you go, well, that's it, I'm never going out again. Um, and that's what worries me, that the, the, the sort of great fear element uh, that, uh, that has been built up without really enough discussion at an expert level. You know, there are experts out there who are saying, you got this wrong because, and you're going, no, we're not talking to you. We are the experts who advise government. You just listen to us and that's it. Um, and so there's quite a sort of group of people, the Barrington Declaration, uh, people out there who've said, no, you got this wrong. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. You know, the tests you have for PCR, lateral flow tests, they're not really good. Uh, they're not telling you what you need to know. You need to change this, change this. No debate about that. It's uh, ignore that. Uh, we're doing it this way and that's it. That's the worrying thing. So, and, and even social media has jumped on this and starts to try and close down good debate and just leave silly things on uh, on social media that, uh, like you say, why are they talking about those things uh, in that way? You know, we should be solving these problems, not just bickering. Exactly. What do you think governments should have done um, instead of obviously, you know, locking down how a lot of them have? What do you believe should have been done instead? Well, quite clearly, uh, the statistics are out there, although they're not always thrown out there, uh, that tells you who are the people who are vulnerable 
to this particular uh, virus. And those people are with underlying conditions. Healthy people almost of every age uh, are not likely to be, certainly not die from this. They might have a, you know, what we all have in a winter season, a bad cold or, you know, touch of flu or something. Those sort of things would happen, but we should have identified quite clearly those people who uh, have the underlying condition. And in the UK, the shielding letters went out to people who doctors thought would be vulnerable to this. Now, you could have gone with that shielding group of people and said, you know, here's the risk. You are at much higher risk if you catch this. So don't do this. Don't do that. Let them at the end of the day make up their own mind, but advise and the furlough scheme, which was sort of money thrown out to everyone for not working, could quite easily have been targeted at just those people with shielding letters who would then go to their employer and say, I've got a shielding letter. Uh, I can't come to work for a month or two months or whatever it is. And they should then be the people who receive furlough. You shouldn't have gone down closing large chunks of industry um, and the hospitality sector uh, in order to try and control something that is really very targeted. Uh, I think the average age in the UK hasn't changed much. You have to be, the average age of people dying from COVID is 82.4 months, I think, mean, something like that. So, the, so I would have let the economy continue. I wouldn't have locked down anything. I mean, I can say this now because uh, we can never test whether I was right, but I would not have locked down the economy. Uh, I would have just looked very hard at protecting people in care homes, people with underlying conditions, warning everybody of the risks, doing sensible things with regard to hygiene. I've, I've never quite been convinced about masks, um, but social distancing uh, is okay. And uh, unfortunately, cuddling is always, uh, um, I, I'm sure we should have carried on cuddling. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, I do have a sort of alternative framework in my mind so I'm not just being critical and you've got this wrong I'm going you've got this wrong you should have done that instead um, so I'm quite happy to argue uh, this case through as I often do but then the experts come back and say no we've got the model we predict one of the sad things at the moment in the UK is the government you know like they did catchphrases so they jumped up with this catchphrase that says we are driven by the data we're not driven by dates and immediately announce dates on which this is the earliest something is going to happen, which means you're driven by dates, not data, because at the moment things are improving very quickly in the UK, but they've got their dates for next month and the month after, where if they were driven by data, they'd be going, okay, well, we can open up next week. But they're going, no, we'll test next week and see how it is with schools. And then if we don't get any bad results there, we'll do something else and we'll do something. They're driven by dates, but they've said they're driven by data. And the data they're driven by is not real numbers, it's predictions from models. The data says that in uh, next month, this will happen if we do that. And of course, as we all know, there are no facts whatsoever about the future. Um, so you cannot be driven by data in the future. You've got to be driven by the data that is actually there now and is current. And that data says we might as well return to normal, um, but we're driven by predictions that they call data. So we start with dates. Was there anywhere that you were aware of um, internationally that did decide to do exactly what you've just sort of described there, where they actually kept their economy open and they just decided, okay, you know what, we're just going to um, yep. basically deal with this and um, any of the, you know, the elderly people that are obviously more vulnerable to this disease, um, you guys obviously make your own choice, stay at home if you must, that's fine. Um, but were there any, yeah, countries that actually decided yeah. to do that? No one has done it exactly like that, but I do like the Sweden model, because Sweden didn't close down their economy. Sweden carried on uh, doing things normally and worked, you know, harder on protecting people, making people aware of these things. And right at the start, you know, I said, um, Sweden are doing it differently from us and other people. Uh, and at the end of this, we can judge who got it right. So in other words, they were looking more for herd immunity uh, than they were for uh, waiting for vaccinations uh, and dealing with that. Now, lots of people around the world, of course, have rubbished Sweden and tried to find any statistic they possibly can to say, no, they got it wrong, because if they got it wrong, then we got it right. But if you look at the statistics, they have been no worse off than we have. So if you compare them with the UK, 
Uh, they've been no worse off than we have, uh, and they have saved their economy. Um, and indeed, their statistics now look better than ours. Their medical statistics look better than ours now. So in two senses, I think they got it right. But the criticism is always, no, you look at Denmark and compare it with Sweden. Denmark were, were much better off. Than so deflect the attention away. You just compare the UK with Sweden because they both did it differently. And I, I don't think you can do anything other than conclude Sweden got it right, we got it wrong. Yeah, very interesting. What, um, what was the outcome for Sweden's economy then? So they kept everything open. Um, yeah. yeah, hospitality kept open. You could go down the bar, you could go to the cinema, you could go to the theatre, you could go and stay in other places. So they kept all of those things functioning um, throughout the pandemic, but they were aware uh, and be a little bit more careful. I think there were social distancing rules uh, and, and there were certain things going on. Now, the impact on their economy is, of course, not zero because travel, um, international travel uh, and, and lots of, of people visit Sweden uh, throughout the year. So uh, a lot of um, a fall off in demand around the west, rest of the world through, through lockdown means that their exports were affected. Uh, and, and so, you know, rough guess, and I really don't know, the, I know our economy is more or less contracted by about 10%, and I think there's possibly by two or 3%, but I, I will stand to be corrected on that. I'm just plucking that out of here. It's, it's affected Sweden because of the international situation, but a lot less than it's affected us because they did it differently. Yeah, wow. So you mentioned the UK economy is fallen. Sorry, you said 10%, yeah. just to clarify. Wow. That's, so, is, that, is that the biggest in history? Uh, outside any wartime, uh, which you wouldn't make comparisons, yeah, that's the biggest drop over uh, a short period of time. And, um, you know, everyone is there, the recovery will take. One of the things that lockdown has done is actually extended the period uh, for which we will actually suffer inflation because there are two elements uh, which uh, cause inflation. It's monetary demand and it's made up of two things. It's the stock of money in the economy and the speed you pass it on from person to person. Now, the stock of money in the economy has grown very rapidly over this period of time, but the speed at which you can pass it on has slowed down. So that makes monetary demand move a little bit slower than it would otherwise move. But as soon as we do, if ever we get back to normal, that monetary demand will pick up considerably and that's when the inflation will really hit. So we've almost pushed inflation back a few months by carrying on with the lockdown. Um, but it will happen and you can invite me back this time next year and you go, yeah, you got it right or don't invite me back and don't tell anybody you ever knew me. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean then for... Um just in layman's terms, what does that mean then if obviously the um, currency gets inflated, what sort of things would people typically start to see um, just in their everyday life, just to kind of put a bit of context around um, what's going to happen? Yeah, their money won't go as far as it did before. There'll be just a fall in the value of their money. So they go out and buy their food and they'll find that it's 10% uh, more. Uh, they'll try and go on holiday and they'll find out that, crikey, these costs have gone up a lot. Uh, You'll even go down the pub and you'll find a pint of beer has got an extra 30p on it. Uh, and so it goes on. Um, it, it's, it's like that. So the, the basic things that you buy. See, a lot of this inflation also is off the measures because it's gone into asset prices. So there's quite a lot of demand has gone into asset prices, which are not recorded in inflation statistics. Quite a lot of has gone into property, house prices, not recorded in statistics. So the inflation uh, is there and, and won't be sort of available for everyone in the statistics that are announced every month. Uh, but uh, it, it is uh, still there. And that's, again, what, there are two elements to this. It's Bank of England monetary policy. The worst in terms of property prices and assets is interest rates. So reducing official interest rates low, that uh, means there's an inverse relationship. Asset prices go up. You know, quite a simple transmission mechanism because people wanted to save and there's no reward from savings so they go into investments and they well they don't know what they're doing but they buy into uh, shares they buy an extra house uh, they better buy a holiday home 
uh, and at some point in time these bubbles burst and when these bubbles burst that adds another element of uh, a problem not only is uh, are you finding that uh, your shopping has gone up uh, and is more expensive you'll find you're in negative equity up on property and uh, you'll find stock markets are dipping again and you'll go crush i've just gone into stock markets because they were doing so well and uh, the experts and the professionals will go, yeah, it was the time to leave the market. It wasn't the time to join the market. Uh, as we, we all know, the professionals leave when the uh, amateurs get in uh, and then the professionals come back in when the amateurs are leaving. With, with maybe the exception of um, the Wall Street bet saga, I don't know if you saw, saw that, but... Um... Uh, tell me a little more about it. I, I, I won't jump in because I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. Oh, okay, so basically, um, the very condensed version of the story is um, there was a couple of different stocks um, trading on the uh, American Stock Exchange. Um, one of them was called GameStop, which was basically a yeah, I was basically a um, like a boutique game store. You could go in and purchase um, you know games that you could play on like your Xbox or like PlayStation, whatever sort of gaming console you decided to play on. Uh, long story short, people um, realized that basically institutional investors were um, uh, betting against GameStop. So they thought that in the future, the stock um, price was going to go down quite significantly. Um, and there was, there's been a, a Wall Street, the, the group's called Wall Street Bets. So it's like a Reddit group, which is just a forum um, sort of social media platform, I guess, um, that ended up having quite a significant amount of people um, on it. Uh, and they decided to go, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's bet against what the institutions have said and let's actually pump this stock up. Um, and obviously, you know, over, over the course of, I think it was three or four weeks, um, the stock went from about $20 and it, I think it peaked all the way up somewhere now around about that $300 odd dollar mark um, US dollars. So a lot of people yeah. obviously made quite a bit of money and some people obviously lost out, but I think it was more of a, a message to the, you know, people uh, on Wall Street who, you know, tend to hold most of the power, I guess, in those sort of situations to say, hey, look, we still actually have a voice. Check this out. This is what we're going to do. So that's the very condensed version of what happened. I think it was a little bit more sophisticated than that. There was obviously more element, elements to it. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the, the condensed version. Yeah, and that is what happens in markets where information is not uh, equally distributed throughout uh, those markets. And of course, you can go back and see the pre-story uh, to this, which was the big short uh, before the global financial crisis. So yeah, what's the film, The Big Short, and you'll get a, a good idea of people doing exactly that, going uh, property, securitized values of, of bundles of properties are all mispriced, uh, and this is going to collapse. Uh, so you short everything and it collapses. And this, you know, that's a mini example of that. Um, at the moment, things are uh, going uh, a way that we can see a way of making lots of money by shorting markets. So. It, it'll continue all the time and even more so now because um, you only have to think if interest rates, official interest rates are, are what would be called ZERP, zero interest rate or NERP, uh, negative interest rate and asset prices are inversely related, then they are very high. Now, there's nowhere to go, really. You can't keep going interest rates, more negative, more negative, more negative. There's some point at which you have to reverse that process. And as soon as you have to reverse that process, uh, then, of course, there's a shorting option uh, available because it means straight away asset prices are going to go down. Um, and that process will be reversed uh, probably by inflation because when inflation starts to pick up, central banks will have to start raising nominal rates. And when nominal rates rise, uh, the actual uh, asset price will fall and that will be the time to short. So there's another big short on the way, um, which will probably be towards the end of this year, uh, my guess. So big short too. Uh, we, could, we could make the Hollywood film now, couldn't we? Of, uh, what's going to happen at, at the end of this year? Yeah, but the shorting process is just where you know, information is um, centralised in one area and not available 
you know, it's what in, in finance, um, financial terms you would think of as asymmetric information. And if you want to use that as a link to Bitcoin, of course, then you can see Elon Musk, um, lots of dollars around that he didn't know what to do with and thought, oh, Bitcoin's a good thing. So uh, I don't know how many million dollars of Bitcoin he bought uh, in a very short space of time, uh, betting on uh, Bitcoin, maintaining its value and going up. Um, yeah, it was $1.3 billion. Was it? And, uh, and he'll get burned. Uh, a significant <laughs> amount of money, yeah. Yeah. So this, um, sorry, I just wanted to touch on the information side of things that you mentioned. So this, um, like, I guess, exclusive sort of information actually does sort of happen. This is, this is a common occurrence. It's not, you know, people sort of throw around the term um, insider trading. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you know, from my understanding, is that just sort of basically having information or access to information that people don't necessarily have the same access to and using that to your advantage? Exactly. And it's the herd thing as well. Uh, once one person goes in and sees something moving, they don't know why it's moving, but they think I better get in there uh, because it's moving and that makes it move even further. Let me take you back to sort of a nice, simple example in, in days gone by when, when things were much easier to understand and much more normal. Um, you, you had a situation where journalists would sort of investigate, they do their research companies, uh, and I can't mention newspapers or, or particular names, but they, they'd research um, something and they try and find something in the market that's mispriced, if you like, uh, or this knowledge is not known yet and there's a great order coming for this firm or whatever it is. Uh, and then on Friday, they would buy into these shares. Uh, so they would then uh, write their columns for Saturday and Sunday saying these shares are on the move, these shares are going to really go, and this is the reason why uh, this is going to happen. And then on Monday morning, the share prices shot up as everyone got into listening to these advice and all the people who bought on Friday sell on Monday and, uh, and make, their, make their profit. Uh, so these things have gone on <laughs> uh, for uh, uh, decades, uh, whereby if you've got information that no one else has got and you can research that information, you know, it can just be total rumour. Let's make something up and people will respond. Uh, I remember one of my students in the very early days, someone who set up uh, one of the, uh, the Hong Kong trading desks and made himself uh, a lot of money. But I went and visited him when he was working trading. Um, and I just said to him, you know, what, what's your guidance? Uh, are you looking at these figures? Are you, you know, I can tell you what's going to happen next week and next year. He said, no, no, we don't bother with anywhere. We just follow what happens in the markets. Um, and, you know, on, on the ball, when something moves, you get in quickly and get out. We don't understand what's going on. We're, we're not even bothered about that. We just uh, follow the big players. We know the people who know what's going on and we just uh, get in there and follow them. So it, it's that sort of thing. There are two lots. There are people who know, who've done their research and, and realise there's some mispricing here and they're going to take advantage of that. And then there are the followers. And the followers are the ones who um, will still make money out of it, not quite as much as the person who did it originally. Uh, and then um, you'll often find research showing you how this is a great market to be in right at the point in time it's at its peak and then you know the amateurs the people would, well we better do that you know we're not earning anything on our savings we better put our money there and then a month later they go we've just lost 20 percent of our life savings and that's what i would you know very much like to protect people against uh, that situation and therefore i do think central banks have a real responsibility to maintain real prices and proper prices so you know, I would have my um, official interest rate set by the central bank uh, at the moment at about 2% above inflation, whatever it is. And I, I like a measure of inflation called RPI, not CPI. That's the wrong measure. Um, so I would have uh, um, bank rate, Fed funds rate, whatever. What's the Australian official rate? Um, central bank rate, what, what's its acronym? I can't think uh, of the uh, top one. So you're talking about the Royal Bank of Australia? Yeah. And what's its official rate for rediscounting first class bills, as they used to call it, or the repo rate now? Um, to be honest, sorry, I'm not sure. Put you on the spot. Um, That's OK. Yeah, I would. That would be, to my mind, 4% now, not 
0.1% is, is in the UK. So bank rate in the UK at the moment is 0.1%, whereas I would have it at 4%. That was shock off people. And that's obviously quite a low figure in terms of if you look back in the, on its history. Yeah. If, if you go to, um, if you look back from um, 19, where are we now? 2000, 2006. I've never known bank rate be below 5%. Ever. Yeah. Well, and now bank, bank rate suddenly went down to 0.5%. 0. I know why it's wrong, uh, but there is um, monetary policy. The central banks think they've got two options. They think they've got an option to lower interest rates, which means if interest rates go down, lots of people go out borrowing more and that would expand the economy. Or you can increase the quantity of money in the economy, which is what happens through quantitative easing. You've heard that uh, uh, area. Now, they're two different things. I'm quite happy with uh, dealing with quantity aggregates. But the whole Austrian, if you like, monetarist, less interventionist says, Whatever you do, don't interfere with pricing in any markets and official interest rates is interfering with prices. That's why we've got asset bubbles. Uh, and so I would go, no, you're a central bank. You can hit an inflation target by using quantity of money controls. Don't influence interest rates, leave the market interest rate to, um, to settle uh, and therefore you'll get the best allocation of resources to borrowers, lenders, investors, savers, the whole, whole lot. But at the moment, you put everything in favour of the people who know how markets work against the people who don't know how markets work and are just throwing money willy-nilly at um, investments. Uh, and remember, the difference between investments and savings, savings are capital protected. So if you put a £1,000 in the bank, you get a £1,000 back. Inflation risk, but you still get a thousand pounds back. Put a thousand pounds into an investment fund and it might be worth 500 pounds uh, in a month's time. So your capital is at risk. Um, people who put their money at risk in that sense, who don't know what they're doing, are the people who are going to lose out. Um, and they're the people I would like uh, to think. No, there are savings out there. You can get 5% on your savings. Uh, stick with that because that's safe. You're coming up to retirement. You don't want to risk anything. You want that income. And that's all gone with uh, interest rates being brought all the way down to almost zero and officially brought down below zero in some countries. Is that what you'd probably recommend to do in this situation for a lot of people is to actually instead of, you know, we see a lot of people going out and investing in different markets, um, property, shares, Bitcoin, that sort of stuff. Would you actually recommend people to go and basically just put the cash in a, vault, in a vault somewhere or obviously in the bank somewhere? And just hold on to it for a while do you think that's probably a better strategy than some of these other investment strategies considering uh, that they're probably right, going to be quite soon holding on to cash if you don't know what you're doing is probably the best thing to do uh, but if you do know what you're doing uh, you, then you would need to be buying into real things um, so it is um, things like property uh, it is things like gold uh, uh, i don't count bitcoin as a real thing i'll explain why um, but yes, it's that. But unfortunately, the markets are very floppy at the moment because people have been doing exactly that. And you go, there'll be a correction there. And if there's a 20% correction in those markets next year, you're going to look to me and go, we went and bought some gold. It's, it's dropped by 30%. We went. So it's very, very difficult at the moment to, to time anything. And as we all know, timing is essential in all markets. Uh, so, yeah, I would be thinking of buying some gold and some properties in about six months. As soon as inflation really starts to pick up, then that, that's the time uh, to, to look for real things. But it is, um, it is worrying that what you really are doing is destroying savings and destroying pensions by what central bank policies are doing. And you go, well, how on earth can we, um, we deal with that? I mean, I know property prices are going to fall. I just don't know when. Um, it depends how many little tricks there are to try and stop that happening. In fact, my eldest son, many years ago, living in London, uh, said, uh, Dad, I, I've got a flat I can buy for £200,000. Um, what do you reckon? I said, well, look, probably prices are going to fall sometime. If you can afford the mortgage, buy it, but be warned. 
So he bought it 18 months later, he sold it for £400,000. He then said, I've got the opportunity in Wimbledon to buy a property for £600,000. What do you reckon, Dad? So I said, well, look, property prices are going to fall. Um, uh, I said, if you can afford the mortgage, do that. Um, and this has carried on. So he now lives in a million pound house in Epsom. Um, and uh, uh, he's still waiting for property prices to fall. And I've been telling him this for the last 15 years. And because I never expected that uh, interest rates would be officially brought down from 5.75 to 0.5. That's what's kept this market uh, uh, alive for property. Uh, but adjustments will come. Um, I just don't know when. So never, yeah, never ask me for, for a date. I can tell you if something's going to happen, but I just don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah, I could imagine it'd be very hard to predict. Obviously, you can kind of sort of see the writing on the wall, though. So, yeah, it is obviously going to happen eventually. Just knowing when is pretty pretty difficult to predict, which obviously most people can can understand. Um, I wouldn't mind segueing a little bit into um, while we're on the topic of uh, like different asset classes and investments. Um, but I wouldn't mind if you, before we sort of move over to the Bitcoin discussion, um, would you mind giving just the viewers a little bit of a, say, a brief five minute history of, of money? Um, yeah, what particular, do you want to know what money is? But yeah, uh, maybe what money is and maybe, maybe the history of money, if you can condense that into maybe about five minutes. If not, well, if you go over, that's fine. I'll I do, I do the best I can. Money is just something that's almost unimportant. All it is is a medium of exchange. It's a way of transferring uh, real things from person to person. And, and so money is, is quite an unimportant thing. It developed uh, quite naturally uh, out of uh, um, real things. Uh, so that uh, I suppose the end of real things was gold and silver, which you could nice make nice and easy into coins. Um, and this became money. Uh, and then banks. At the point in time that banks developed, uh, then you found that you could actually create new money. Now, you'll have to read my book or you'll have to read uh, my blog or you'll have to listen to my lectures for this, but it's really quite straight. There were in London goldsmiths who turned into bankers. The goldsmiths were people who just uh, were jewellers. So they had vaults and gold. And during the English Civil War, they started to look after people's gold because it was safe. Uh, and charge people for doing it. Now, they would then give you a receipt for that. And that receipt was something you could pass on to other people if you wanted to transfer the ownership of that gold in order to buy something real. Now, initially, there's 100% backing. Or the receipts in circulation are exactly the same as the gold that sits there. But then you realize I've got lots of gold sitting here that's never wanted because people are quite happy to use these pieces of paper and pass them around to each other. Uh, and you think, I could lend this to someone. And there's always governments and someone who wants to borrow money. And you go, well, wow, there's lots of money can be made here by lending out money. As soon as you lend out money, you say, well, do you want to borrow the gold or would you just want one of the receipts? And you go, well, I have a receipt. I don't want to carry this gold around or go and get it minted. And then you create more receipts than there are. There is gold in circulation. And it's the lending process of banks, which creates new receipts. Now, that means that you've controlled uh, creation through the banking system and money creation uh, exists now uh, as the result of um, private banking and central banking so if you looked at the amount of money in Australia uh, the amount of money in the UK the USA less than 10 percent in the UK less than five percent of it is currency is central bank notes and coins 95% of it is uh, just uh, balance sheet numbers that are created through bank lending. So if um, we wanted to remove money from the economy by taking cash out, you can't. The, the cash isn't there. The cash is just the base upon which you've built money. And money is just your confidence that, uh, that, that money is there whenever you want it in the form of cash. And it isn't but it is as long as you don't want it, if, if that makes sense. So money is something that uh, developed quite naturally without any involvement of central banks. But central banks have taken control now, so they manage money. So central banks issue legal currency, and they also manage 
private banks and say, well, you mustn't lend too much. You need to limit yourself in this way and this way and this way. Uh, so there are sort of checks and balances where the central bank controls the total amount of money in the economy and also act as a lender of last resort. So that if there were any problems, they could always create the cash necessary to fill a gap. Um, so that's my side of things. But the, um, the, one, the, the one other thing to say about, uh, uh, no, I've forgotten. Go on, you ask your question. Yeah, sorry. I actually had a two two part question. The first That's part right. is um, why did why did people decide to use gold and silver as um, you know as their means to sort of peg their currency to? And then obviously that's you know no longer the case. Um, the, the gold standard isn't a thing anymore. Um, so, so when did obviously that all sort of you know become abolished and um, the fiat currency that we're sort of under or fiat system right. actually that we're under now come into play? Well. Gold uh, was, I suppose, the first international currency. Uh, I mean, if you go right the way back to the beginning, anything that was generally acceptable would develop as money. Uh, so uh, in my, I think I give a simple example of being a, uh, a caveman. Uh, and as a caveman in the hunter-gatherer society, uh, I'm the hunter, the bloke in the next door caves, a vegetarian, woofter. Uh, and uh, as a vegetarian, uh, he doesn't like to go out hunting, so I do the hunting uh, and I um, have lots of skins and he wants some of my skins and I quite like a bit of vegetable with my meat, so I trade uh, some of my skins with his vegetables, but I, my skin's worth more than his vegetables, so I want a bit more from him. So I say, right, I'll have some of that salt there um, to make up the, the gap, and I take that salt. Now that's money, because I haven't taken that salt because I want it, I've taken that salt because I know other people want it, and I can hold on to it and I can get rid of it whenever uh, I need to get rid of it. So things like salt, things like animal hides, things like cowrie shells. Uh, in Newfoundland, it was dried cod uh, that became a source of money. Prisons, you know, cigarettes are a source of money, if you like, a way of, of trading. So all of these things develop, but you can't see any of these becoming international currencies. Gold and silver, however, you can, because lots of countries started to produce their own coins in, in metal coins. Uh, so when you got to a situation that you were on the gold standard, which meant that all notes in circulation could be transferred into gold, this had some international status to it. Because if you, uh, in 1908, if you held sterling in Australia, you know that's gold. You know that you can transfer that into gold and get the gold whenever you want. Um, but when you go and have a war in 1914, you suspend the gold, now you can't get your gold. So if you're sitting in Australia holding some sterling, you can't now have your gold back. So after the First World War, we did the honorable thing and tried to return to the pre-war gold um, exchange rate uh, so that people in Australia could change their sterling back into gold. And it lasted until 1931. We got it all wrong because what happens is if you finance a war by printing money, you get loads of inflation. If you then try and return to the pre-war uh, rate, uh, then you've got to destroy loads of money, you get loads of deflation, uh, which is what we got wrong after the First World War, which is why um, we had a, uh, a difficult time uh, in the UK immediately. And it's what America got wrong after the Wall Street crash. They allowed their money to contract as well and caused the Great Depression. Um, so we've then moved into fiat, but, Bretton Woods created the gold exchange standard, which meant, unfortunately, that normal people like you and I could not get gold with our notes, um, uh, but uh, banks, central banks could. So officially, if you watch the James Bond film, you know Fort Knox had the gold, uh, and that was the backing for um, uh, the international gold exchange standard. And the international gold exchange standard uh, would, would then be uh, the You've probably seen if you if you looked at my lecture. I'm not sure you see this, can you? Yes, you, we can. Can, you, you can see on this. That was the gold standard this period of time here. So things are relatively stable. That's going off the gold standard. First World War. Deflation. Tried to get back on it. Gave up. You get that. You then had the gold exchange standard, which was fairly stable. That period of time there linked to gold. And then 1971, you go off it 
and there we are, you're back up again uh, with uh, instability. Uh, and you get a bit more stability here, but it's, it's this sort of instability which has opened the door for cryptocurrencies because you go, crypto is much more stable than that. It's just like the old gold standard or gold exchange standard. Um, but as I say, or as I, I'm about to say at some point in time, there is a fatal flaw in alternative currencies and in Bitcoin, which uh, wasn't there with gold. Sure. So look, I wouldn't mind chatting about that, to be honest with you. Um, what do you see the main differences then between obviously gold um, and Bitcoin, a apart from the obvious fact that, you know, gold is actually a tangible item that you can physically, you know, take home and, and store under your mattress if, if you so wish to. Um, I don't know why you would do that, but if that's what you decided that you wanted to do. Um, well, no, you might it. Yeah. Gold, yes. you might, you know, might have a ring of, of gold or, or whatever it uh, whatever it may be. Uh, I had to say that because the wife's listening in the next room, I expect. Um, <laughs> so gold is useful. Uh, you know, gold does things. Uh, but uh, uh, alternative currencies, uh, although someone did make some Bitcoins for some time, didn't they? And I always sort of use the joke that when Bitcoin has lost all its value, it'll still have a jewellery value and you'll be able to put it on a little pendant and, and wear it around your neck and you go to people, look at that Bitcoin. You know, that used to be worth £45,000 and I bought it down the market for £5. Um, <laughs> so, so Bitcoin might turn into jewellery. But um, it is the fact that, that alternative currencies don't have um, any value at all, other than if they're going to be used as currencies. And the fatal flaw is that they are so unstable that, and volatile that they will never be used as currencies. So we're, we're all betting on these things becoming an international currency uh, when they won't. Um, and they won't because of this sort of fatal flaw, if you like, that they have no real value, uh, whereas gold did have value. But if you trace the history of Bitcoin, it tried to trace almost the history of gold because you mined gold, you found gold, uh, people used gold, it then got turned into money. So when you discovered loads of gold, there was a sort of inflationary period because all of a sudden lots of gold because these prospectors who found gold could never keep quiet. They went and uh, ran down the hill, didn't they? Went, yee-haw, I found some gold. Everyone runs up and it's exhausted very quickly. So you get an inflationary period and then it's gone. So output continues to expand. You get a deflationary period because there's only a fixed amount of gold there uh, and it doesn't change until gold prices start to rise, which is the deflation. Gold prices go up when prices go down of everything else. And then it becomes worthwhile looking somewhere else for it. And someone else will find it, and then it, up it goes again. So you've got this inflation deflation period uh, during a gold standard. Now, Bitcoin almost leveled that out because Bitcoin, yeah, we're going to mine it. So we, we still mine Bitcoin, which will make sure that it only grows at a slow rate. Uh, and we, you don't actually get this sort of deflationary period, except speculation brings that on board because. Like we said earlier, people don't really know what's going on, don't really understand Bitcoin, but go, crikey, this is going up. We better get into that market. Uh, and up it goes a bit further and a bit further. And then someone like me comes along and says, no, it's a false paradise, this one. You really are uh, you know, in for a fall. Uh, so then people start selling it and it goes back down again. Uh, and then someone says, no, it's, it's, it's all right. It, it'll be back up there. But the whole thing is you're betting with Bitcoin that they will become international currencies. Um, I mean, I haven't had an argument with someone who's, uh, you know, I quite respect the, the way they argue. They went, you know, Bitcoin isn't, um, it is stable. It's inflating by about 2.18% a year, which is very stable, you know, much more stable than gold was. And you go, no, you've used the wrong word there. You don't mean inflating, you mean growing. So the amount of new mined Bitcoins coming onto the market is growing but Bitcoin is actually deflationary because when Bitcoin goes up in price, what you can buy with Bitcoin has effectively gone down, with, down in price. And because your Bitcoin, you think of a Bitcoin over 10 years has changed from being um, less than one Australian dollar. 
uh, at one time. You get one Bitcoin for less than one Australian dollar. I don't know what it is in Australian dollar terms at the moment. Do you know what the price of Bitcoin is uh, today in Australian dollars? I think it's around about the $60,000 mark, roughly. So one Bitcoin changed from one Australian dollar to 60. So you can see how on earth could this ever become a currency? And there are people, no, eventually it will stabilize. But of course, uh, it won't. Do you think, so, sorry, yeah. do you think it eventually will stabilize? I know, um, you know, a relatively well known gentleman by the name of Michael Saylor, who's quite a big proponent of, yeah. of Bitcoin itself being um, a store of value. And his company, um, MicroStrategy, have invested, you know, large sums of, of money um, in terms of yeah. you know, billions of dollars. Um, he, yeah. he sort of predicted at the moment, the market cap for Bitcoin is only around about $1 trillion as compared to golds, which is about $10 trillion. Um, He's predicted as, you know, when the market cap of Bitcoin does hit around about $10 trillion, it will start to sort of stabilise. Do you do you sort of see that happening as well? I better whisper this, haven't I? Uh, no, the bit price of Bitcoin was stabilised when it hits its jewellery value. Um, so... <laughs> It'll stabilise when it goes back down to about one Bitcoin for one Australian dollar. Um, there's nothing inherently strong about Bitcoin other than talking up rumour, expectations. It might become, it will therefore have more value. Um, and, and quite often you know that there are people who make lots of money, you know, the early adopters of things make lots of money and then will be singing about it for the rest of their lives. Uh, and then there'll be the other people uh, who will come into the market. They won't actually make their money out of Bitcoin, but they'll make their money out of selling you a strategy for buying Bitcoin and selling Bitcoin and trading Bitcoin. Um, and uh, you go, well, why, why aren't you actually out there buying it? Uh, because there's much more stable income in encouraging you to go out there and buy it. And we'll give you the advice and everything else. So there are plenty of people out there. Uh, saying what wonderful things will happen with regard to Bitcoin and alternative currencies. But I can't see any logic behind it uh, at all. The central banks will fight back. Uh, the central banks will create a situation. Uh, they can control money, central banks, believe it or not. That's why they have a target. They go, your target is 2% inflation. They can hit that target if they want. They don't hit that target because someone has made them believe they can do a lot more than just maintain the average level of prices they told them. Monetary policy is so important. You can grow the economy, you can create jobs, uh, you can finance us through a pandemic. You can do all these wonderful things in central bank. Go, oh, can we? That's great. So they then go down this route um, and then they'll have a hiccup. You know, we'll get 10% inflation as a result of what they've done. Uh, and the central bank knows what's going on and they will just bring it back down. And as soon as central bank money is stable bitcoin's got nowhere to go bitcoin the option for bitcoin is to sneak in if the dollar collapses if sterling collapses if the euro collapses and people will go well what, what can we hold that will give us some protection and they'll go well it's the alternative currencies that's what you've got to go for central banks are that, that happen they know enough to keep uh, a, a lid on inflation uh, in the 70s, we had inflation of 30%, just under one year. It sort of went up because Keynes and economists got it all wrong. We went up from 5% inflation to 10 to 25%. It went up to about 26, 27% in one year. And they recovered from that. Now we're worried about going up to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10%. Central banks will recover from that. Um, Bitcoin will only step in if currencies collapse. And, uh, uh, there's more chance of the dollar collapsing, I must admit, than there is a sterling, but that's another story. <laughs> so you don't see you don't see Bitcoin itself being um, an alternative like store of value at all? No. And it is only an asset that has value because people think it will eventually become a currency. And so if ever, you know, talking to someone who's very enthusiastic about Bitcoin, I've always suggested you get in and out, in and out, in and out. Don't stay there. You're going to lose a lot of money eventually but over the short term it's like trading um you know trading foreign currencies bears no relationship to reality it's just day-to-day uh, -day rumors minute to minute statistics and what someone says about them i know what causes the long-term trend in foreign exchange rates i can predict what's going to happen to currencies over the long term what's going to happen to them tomorrow i have no idea at all 
Um, and it's the same with Bitcoin. I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, someone like Elon Musk will come along and, and, put, and again, he must know what he's doing. Let's get in there. And I don't know what happened with the Musk effect. There must have been a Musk effect that raised Bitcoin up. And then I suspect that the following week it dropped down again by 10 or 15 or 20. I, um, I don't know. Um, but, you know, we follow people, don't we, who think we know, we know what they're talking about. No one ever follows me because I do know what I'm talking about, but it's never good news. <laughs> I, can't you, I can't tell you anything you want to hear. If, uh, you know, if I could, then I'd have loads of followers, but because I can't tell you what you want to hear, then, uh, you know, I just a crank out there who's, uh, who's saying these things, let's ignore him. He's not telling us anything we want to know. You did preface that on the, um, on the start of the podcast, so <laughs> people have been warned anyway. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And we should say it again that uh, I do come with a public health warning, always listening to what my critics and other economists say. Uh, I also said that my conscience is clear. I know I am right, but I don't want you to believe I'm right until you listen to what everyone says and made up your own mind. So, yes, be warned. <laughs> so if Bitcoin's not the um, alternative currency, uh, obviously, uh, if I'm agreeing with your argument there, um, but if Bitcoin isn't the alternative currency to um, you know, what we currently sort of have set up. What's going to happen in the future then? What do you think is going to happen? It will return, I think, to national currencies. I mean, I've written something about how to, uh, uh, how, how the euro uh, will collapse uh, and, uh, and how we'll return to national currencies uh, because you've either got to have, if we want to think of a worldwide currency, you've either got to have a worldwide central bank, you know, IMF or someone who can actually manage that currency and know what they're doing, and they didn't. Uh, and as well as having someone who, who knows what they're doing, who can manage this situation, you've got to be able to do it without um, sort of government saying, no, we need more here, we need more there, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. It would have to be someone who very strictly controls everything. Uh, and controls your fiscal policy. The problem with the euro was bringing all these countries together and, and saying, you've got these monetary disciplines, you're going to do as you're told, but you fisc fiscally you can do what you like. You can't fiscally do what you like if you've got a monetary discipline that does actually cause problems if like Italy or like Greece, uh, you go down a sort of fiscally profligate route, uh, then it all comes back. You've either got to be able to control every country their fiscal situation, their monetary situation, or you've got to go, that's too big a task. It just cannot be done. So let individual countries have their own fiscal policies and monetary policies, and you will see those countries that manage these best will do best, and those countries that don't manage it well will hopefully look to them and go, let's take advice from how wonderful they were in uh, Australia or the UK or America. No one would want to take advice from us now, but individual countries doing their own thing with, in terms of monetary policy and fiscal policy is probably best, which means it's going to be a return to national currencies. And therefore, there will always be opportunities to trade as on foreign exchange markets, because foreign exchange markets are one of the best markets out there. They do actually reflect daily supply and demand. Um, Whereas uh, a lot of other markets just try and distort these two particular things, but uh, um, it doesn't happen in foreign exchange markets. So national currencies and foreign ex which return to uh, uh, traded uh, uh, currencies on, on forex markets. So if we were to sort of, you know, return back to um, our own national currency, then what's it going to be backed by? Do you think it will still not be backed by anything? Uh, there's no need to back currency by anything other than common sense. As you saw with that sort of inflation numbers there, on that thing there, if you've got a real commodity behind it, um, it does create more stability. Uh, but it's not totally stable. You can create much more stability by just having a central bank with one target. Can you do that? Yes, you can do. I mean, this bit at the end here, sorry, once the UK Bank of England became independent, from 97 around to the global financial crisis, there was a lot of stability there. A central bank can do that. A fiat currency can do that. It's not important that currency is backed by anything at all. All you want is a unit of account that stores 
uh, wealth stores value over time is a standard of deferred payment uh, and a medium of exchange that everyone accepts. Now, central banks can do that. They can do that efficiently um, as long as you don't ask them to do too much. You know, central banks are not great at doing anything else, but they can control uh, inflation. As long as you can control inflation, uh, then what you do is create the right environment within which a country can work. You trust pricing, you trust prices, uh, you trust your central bank. You know that pricing is the indicator of what consumers want. When prices go up a bit, then resources shift that way. When they go down, they shift away from that. Um, so no, you don't have to have currency backed by anything at all other than common sense. So you know, I would just look forward to central banks uh, uh, achieving their targets. And as I said, achieving their targets without manipulating interest rates. I was in a big debate in the 1980s about this. I said, whatever you do, don't choose interest rates to manage monetary policy, choose quantity of money controls. So as always, no one listened to me. So they chose interest rates as a way of controlling that money and it's the wrong thing to do. And one day I'll be proved right. But, uh, <laughs> how long we got away, I don't know. <laughs> I was gonna say, unfortunately, um, common sense is a pretty scarce commodity, I, I would argue. So I'm not too sure how well that's gonna, gonna pay off. You'd hope that obviously the right people come along to obviously call the shots and you know run the uh, run the Reserve Bank. Do you see that happening? Um, no, unfortunately, I don't, um, because uh, I mean there are now economic theories out there which go trust government, let them manage money, and they are the last people you want to trust uh, to manage money. Uh, central banks are one step away from government; uh, they provide something of a discipline. Um, and I don't like my central bank directly controlled by the government, but uh, modern monetary theory, positive money, uh, the Minsky model, Stephen King's uh, uh, Minsky model, uh, they're all ones that are based upon getting some um, link between uh, modern monetary theory. It says when governments spend money, they create new money in the economy. When they tax money, they destroy money. All wrong. It's nothing to do with that. The money's there all the time. What they're doing is taking income out of the economy and putting it back into the economy uh, with what they're doing. Uh, so I worry that we might find ourselves in a situation uh, where we will put governments in control of central banks. And then can you imagine politicians uh, going, right, we need some more money for this. Uh, what do we do? Oh, it's all right, we can print it. Well, we need more money for that as well. What's we do? Oh, you can print it. Um, and modern monetary theory says you'll eventually come up against a wall of inflation. So I think your very own Bill Mitchell down in Australia thinks about 2% unemployment is the, is the limit uh, which you will get, you know, inflation. But unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. There's just a time lag. So modern monetary theory, now it's a great example of what they say because we're pumping loads and loads of money into the economy to deal with the pandemic. That's exactly what they would like until we achieve inflation and unemployment targets. Um, but by the time you've achieved those, it's too late. You've already caused the problem because there isn't, if I put money in the economy today, it doesn't cause inflation tomorrow. If I put money in the economy today, it'll cause some inflation in January, 2022, by which time, the gap will be such a disconnect that you go, no, it's, it's nothing to do with what we did a year ago, is it? Uh, and someone will say, no, no, it's just cost push inflation. Um, it's, uh, there's been a bit, bit of a jump in oil prices uh, and uh, we've had to do some recovery on wages uh, after the pandemic. Uh, that's what's caused inflation because you just look at the prices that go up and say they're the cause of inflation, but they're not. The prices that go up are the symptoms of the inflation that was caused a year ago by the actions of central banks. And they're all causing inflation now, so the world's gonna be full of inflation. Well, you know, higher than their target of 2% for a couple of years. Is that something you think the world can sort of pull back from? Do you, do you foresee that actually happening? Yes, as I say, we pulled back from 30% inflation in one year. So yes, uh, inflation is quite a sort of strong signal. And um, as soon as people start to worry about inflation, then central banks and governments will pull back from it. Um, it is this disconnect, this 12 to 18 month time lag. Um, it means they can get away for a period of time with 
persuading people that uh, um, the inflation was never caused by them. It's it's something else. But uh, I have you know debates with uh, various people on the uh, that were on the monetary policy committee of the Bank of England, and I've had those in front of my students. And uh, you know I've gone down this route that you're misleading people with your inflation reports by telling them uh, that inflation is up to this number, and then you read out a list of uh, prices that have gone up. And I said that's deceiving people, isn't it? And they go, no, we don't actually say that they were the cause of the inflation. Uh, we just say those are the prices that have gone up the most and then next day in the press they say oil prices have gone up and caused inflation to rise this has gone up the bank of england don't believe that the bank of england know they cause inflation um, but they don't want you to know that right? so they leave you with information that makes you conclude and it will be the same in australia the central bank causes all your inflation in australia but they will always have a, a reason to deflect the tension away from them and persuade you that uh, um you know the price of uh, of this has gone up because there's been a shortage of cereals or um, you know, oil prices and OPEC have pushed up prices. And it's the hardest thing to understand and see. You know, I'll tell you, if oil prices go up, I can double them, I can treble them, I can quadruple oil prices, that will have absolutely no effect whatsoever on your rate of inflation. Tough one to believe that. They go oil prices, we all use it, cars, energy, the whole lot. All these prices will go up, that's inflation, isn't it? And I go, no, some prices will go up, other prices will go down. The inflation only happens, and it's a simple thing. Inflation is more units of money used in the same number of transactions. You can only have more units of money if the central bank is allowed more units of money. Uh, they are the cause of inflation. Uh, oil prices going up doesn't increase the number of units of money in the economy. Wages going up doesn't increase the number of units of money in the economy. The only thing at the moment that increases the monetary demand in the economy is the central bank. They are the single and sole cause of every inflation you've ever had. But uh, you wouldn't believe that if you listen to other people, would you? <laughs> exactly. Look, you bring up some really interesting points there, John. Um, to be honest, we're probably at about, uh, you know, an hour and 20 minutes. Um, yep. I'd like to try and keep these things around about that mark. Um, are there any final thoughts from yourself that obviously we didn't touch on? Um, well, other than hoping that the, we win the Ashes. Um, uh, <laughs> good, good luck. No, <laughs> not, yeah, exactly. No, no, I mean, I have uh, cousins in, uh, in Melbourne, uh, so we have a little bit of uh, banter about these things but yeah I'm a great fan of cricket I still play cricket uh, so that's the one good thing the cricket season is not going to be affected by lockdown we just come out of lockdown in time uh, to start playing cricket again um, uh, so uh, I suppose the thing to say is let's hope hospitality let's hope sport let's hope gyms let's hope pubs all open up and we never go back to this situation. And let's hope as well that we do have a moratorium on what has happened, why it happened, and say, did we get it right? And if anything like this happens again, as it will, we get it right next time. Um, and as I say, remember the public health warning, everything I've said needs to be thought about very carefully by everybody. Uh, and you must come to all your own decisions. Uh, don't believe that I am right, but uh, I say my conscience is clear. John, thank you very much. Appreciate having you on. Thanks for your time.